This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. It's my pleasure to have with me this morning, once again, Charles Hugh Smith, well-known and prolific writer on the web and the author of the blog uh, of TwoMinds.com. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Gordon. Always a pleasure to be here with you. What I wanted to do, Charles, here today was something a little different than we've done, and that is take a walk down memory lane and go back and, and look at some of the things that we said back in 2012, right or wrong, and, uh, and go through those and, and see how they've turned out and or haven't turned out or what our excuse is, right? So, <laughs> but I, I picked them and they were all subjects that we have, you and I both had a, had a lot of energy on and I have them up here on the, on the, uh, on the screen now, the, the, at least the six that I, I hope to, uh, to, uh, to go through. And the, the first one was actually something that you were quite strong on in terms of financialization. And what you saw happening as we've been happening for a decade. You want to make some comments on your thoughts on financialization? Well, Gordon, I um, I think in that original show, and I think you have the slide up here. I um, used um, the S curve, um, which is um, a, a pattern in nature and 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 human um, behavior as well, in which things ramp up, they reach a plateau, and then they decay or or stagnate. And so it seems that um, from the early 80s, um, financialization ramped up very rapidly. And so you, you saw the, um, the financialization of mortgages where they were packaged and sliced and diced. And, and so the process of financialization is to take something that was once relatively safe and acted like a utility, like mortgages, and then you financialize it into a bunch of, of potentially risky uh, financial instruments. CD, CDC, CDSs, you know, all these different um, derivative products and, um, and you can make a lot of money doing so if you are in the financial industry. But what you've done is you've commoditized and chopped things up and introduced them into a market where now people who buy them and are exposed to them are at great risk. And that, that risk is what is piling up in the system and that eventually uh, we're going to see consequences, and I think, as you say on your slide, we are seeing consequences. Uh, unprecedented central bank manipulations to keep the system they've created afloat. And to, to, to keep it going, the greatest kick the can down the road in, in history. And this whole financialization, you know, the advent of securitization, the advent of shadow banking system, and really what we've got is the financial system sucking money out of the productive assets of our commod our our industry so for example capitalization our uh, capitalist system is about invest investing in productive assets we're not doing that anymore we're investing in financial instruments they're not productive assets all they're doing is taking more out of the producing sector of the of the economy to the tune of 40 45 percent of the stock market now is all financial products they don't they don't produce anything. Their whole core was to be uh, proper asset allocation, capital allocation into productive assets, which which is which is not happening. And I got up this slide to say, so what's happened? It didn't crash the way we thought it was, or we were talking about. We thought it would have to unwind because they've kicked a the can down the road. But what we've ended up with, we talked about this many times: monetary malpractice, and and the distortions that we have now manifestly put into the system. Has, has made it much worse. Mal, malinvestment, lack of price discovery, uh, mispricing of risk, unintended consequences, moral hazard. The list is endless. So the the bottom line to, um, on this, Charles, is that it's when it does break and it will, it's going to be worse than ever ever before. That's that's the problem. So I guess what we're guilty of is being too early. Right, and also um, I myself would, if you'd told me um, 
that uh, we were going to have a world of negative interest rates, I would have um, wouldn't have believed it. We couldn't have done a show on that because if we had, everybody would have said, "You're out of your mind." I went and click, and that would have been it. So you can't be too early. <laughs> Uh, and, and, I, and I did a lot of shows with Ty Andrews on. We ended them when they're going to print the money. Before they started quantitative easing, we were talking about it. Now we have a $4 trillion growth in the balance sheet. And everybody says, yeah, but we knew they were going to do that. So there's the balance. Second one I have up is you and I talked extensively back then, and this was in the May show we started on it, was the total destruction of the middle class. And we said it was, we thought it was doomed. As we move to a have and have not society, and we've talked about, you know, uh, lost pensions. We talked about the, you know, um, housing wealth and what we thought was happening there. Lack of benefits uh, as we went to a, a defined benefits programs versus contributory cost of education, etc. So I, I think that that's unfolded. Probably, actually, I'm showing a second slide here, Charles, of what happened. It, I think it turned out worse than we even thought it was, or at least at a faster rate. Yes, I think so too. And the slide you you have here is um, in the uh, the period in which productivity was increasing and the um, the middle class was participating in the benefits of that increasing productivity. We all grew. In other words, all income brackets uh, had an increase in real income. And from the era of financialization on, then we grew apart in, in that the financialization rewards um, accrue to the top, you know, one tenth of one percent and to some degree to the top five or ten percent who have participation in, in asset bubbles. As every as almost every candidate now in the in the primaries, either party are saying that the top half of one percent now have ninety percent of the wealth. And they're all concerned about that. So we, what we were talking about is now a political issue. I'm not for one moment suggesting they're actually going to be able to fix it, <laughs> but, but at least they're now, they're now talking about it and recognizing it. And it's only getting worse. And we're kill, we killed the golden goose because it's the middle class that consumes. And we're a 70% consumption economy. So when the middle class doesn't, having, doesn't have real growing uh, growth in real incomes, it's it, economy can't do anything other than print money and buy a little more time, but it doesn't fix the problem, right? Because capitalism is about savings being invested. There's no savings. In, do you remember this concept of savings, Charles? I know it's it's almost like yeah. What's that? We're supposed to spend every dime, right? That's what negative interest rates are geared at to in, to force you not to put the money in the bank to pay a penalty so that you'll get out and spend it. We will leave that for another show. Next, right. next, next subject we spent a lot of time on was, and you and I were very concerned about this in, in uh, I guess this was July 2012, that era. We were talking about this migration we were seeing. We call it towards statism, but the, the central, the degree of central planning. So here's, you know, we got internet that distributed, so distributes information. We've got organization flattening to get decision making to the cent to the lowest level. But we've got governments taking on more and more control and more and more decision, central decision making at, at, the, at the government level. So we had this grid here that we says it's going to lead to crony capitalism. It's going to lead to financial repression to be able to pay for it and eventually statism. I, I frankly think we nailed that one. I, I mean, if maybe maybe it's even worse than we were we were thinking that would would, would actually happen. No, I think your your chart was absolutely prescient, um, Gordon, and we can see that now there's a war on cash, which is a subject that we've we've uh, covered and you've uh, addressed with other guests. Um, we've seen capital controls; you can't take more than X amount of money out of the bank, and um, we've seen even in subtle ways, like the mortgage market, it used to be a private. Um, market in which individuals got a mortgage and, and individual uh, private sector banks issued the mortgages and held them. Now virtually 95 percent of the mortgage industry is, is uh, GSEs, you know, government agencies, Fannie and Freddie, and the Fed holding its, you know, 1.1 trillion in, in mortgages. So the government has taken over um, segments of the economy that used to be free market. So now we've lost price discovery. Nobody knows what the cost of money is because the government 
has um, taken absolute control of that. You know, Charles, everybody would say, yeah, you guys are talking about old stuff. We know what happened with the mortgage crisis in 2008 and Fannie Mae, but let's, let's just put a few new different names beside it. Well, we have a, 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 a student loan problem that's phenomenal. I mean, I'd say we got $1.4 trillion in unpayable student loans. They're not going to be paid. Some of them, yes. So what's happened now is they're now called Sally Mae, not Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, because the government's buying all, is holding all of this debt in one way or the other. Now they've went to, they don't even have delinquencies and defaults. They now have a new category called forbearance, which means we can't collect it, but we don't want to and put it off as bad debt. So at some point it's going to have to be forgiven. That it will implode the shadow banking system. We have auto, everybody's got a new car today. Everybody, 35, 37% are leases. They're coming back off leases. What's that mean about residual values? The biggest owner of car leases in America today is the U.S. government. Did you know that, Charles? Well, you do know that, Charles. It is. No, that's used to me. Oh, they are. Oh, $1.1 uh, trillion in, in car. They're the biggest owner of automotives. Now, why is that? They, the governments aren't running around with new cars. What it is is we bought General Motors uh, acceptance, GMAC. We repackaged it. It was called Ally. Ally went out. It's now a privately company. We own stock. We got rid of it. It's now private. We buy all of the securitization products from Ally. We're the ones sitting on all the on the mortgages for the housing at Fannie Mae. We're hold. They're all at at the government's now holding it because they buy the securitization products from Ally as part of the whole takeover from GMAC. Government's financing the car industry in America. Does anybody get that? Now, why is that important? Well, when all these cars come back off lease, who's going to buy them? Well, doesn't that mean that the prices like mortgages are going to drop or the price of the car? So resale values are not going to be 30000 They're going to be 20000 Well, guess who's got them on their book at 30000 what, 20000 the return value after three years? The government, they're going to have to write it all down because they're not going to sell them. And you go to the auctions right now, as far as you can see, are used cars. Three years old, back off lease. Making sense? It's a ticking time bomb here, Charles. This is the new problem with the shadow banking system. So we just keep, and now car sales are slowing. <laughs> so they're stuffing inventory channels. So I, I think we, we, I think we nailed that one. Japan, you were, you, you had some very, very strong opinions on abenomics. Right, and that was um, the uh, central planning pushed uh, to the max and uh, the general consensus now even of the mainstream is economics has failed and uh, so we see central planning in every phase of the economy as you say propping up what um, is unsustainable kicking the can down the road and so um, as, as you say here what we're uh, we've ended up with is a police state with near rebellion showing up in the political primaries and so if we look at why are people voting for Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, uh, because they are outside the mainstream, they are saying that this system is broken. Oh, yeah. This election will be the last election where people are voting with their middle index finger. Um, the, the next one will be with pitchforks and axes and uh, spears if they don't fix this problem. There is an anger that's come out of nowhere. And it's huge. And uh, the P if it's not solved, whoever's elected, and I don't see anybody who's elected co who can actually change, make the changes. And it's not just America, Charles, as you know. We've got Corbyn in, in the UK. We've got Marie Le Pen in France. We have Brillo in Italy. I can keep on going. Every country has got the same sort of anger because the system is not working. The contract between government and the taxpayer or the, dem the the people, the populace, is not there. We The government is not delivering on the contract. And the contract is we, jobs, work, increased standard of living if you work and expire and do the right things. Right now you do all that and all you have is more debt and more problems. Governments are held to that. Then That's the unwritten contract. Right. And you, you've been very on top of um, the the government's attempt to cover all this up with financial repression. And you have a great slide here with um, some examples of financial repression. Yeah, it, it's, it's been 
we you know we do a lot of work over the financial repression <coughs> authority. It, it's not a it's not a conspiracy that's going on. It's people, good people, trying to keep the system the system afloat, trying to plug the cracks in the dam. But every time they do something, another crack appears, and so the problems get worse and worse. And then they're forced to do things. I'm sure they're a little troubled with. And these policies we have, and we're going to helicopter money, um, sure, with it's going to happen, we, we're pro projecting ne negative interest rate. That's now gone, uh, a given. We're going to see a cashless society, which locks all money into the banking system. That's what it's about. <laughs> Don't forget what they tell you. It's so you can't have bank runs. And by the way, when the money's all locked into the system, because you can only keep it in a ca have it in a cashless society, we then have bail-ins, which means you'll lose it if the bank goes under anyway. So... So the government doesn't lose, you lose, and that that's that that's really frightening. So um, I think we nailed that one in terms of Japan. And going back to the Japan uh, comments, QE11 <laughs> didn't work. QQE, which was the next one, didn't work. Now we have NERP. So obviously negative interest rates are going to work. Sweden announced last week they're going to a five-year cashless society to make NERP work. This is this is the wrong road. So I think we got that one right um, on that on that side. Switching gears. So right on time. Keep stay on time. Um, with this Charles. One of the shows that I really enjoyed the most was when we talked about the um, uh, what do we we called it the uh, the global end game. We had actually two shows on it, and and we were projecting what would happen because you rent you eventually have to have a market clearing event. That is to get. As I said earlier, malinvestment price properly, get rack price discovery back in, to to be able to uh, price risk properly, and 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 a market, a falling market generally allows that to happen. I'm not trying to say you want falling markets, but that allows that mechanism. We've done everything we can to to uh, to uh, to stop that, and that that's the problem. You can't you can't not allow that. So for example, we're looking at a recession in my mind in 2016. We're going to try and stop it. The best thing we could do is have a recession. It's as bad as that is. It's like a bad hair day, but you've got to have it. Your comment? I mean, this was your chart, this cycle versus uh, deflation. Um, and I think your one of your the one of the columns there uh, was yours actually. I, what I like about this chart is it mentions what's deferred and hidden, and 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 that I think if there's a message of all of our shows, the takeaway for me is. Um, all these machinations and manipulations and interventions are are largely hidden from the public. You know, pe like we're talking about mortgages and the auto leases. None of that's uh, in, in um, the the regular financial news, right? And um, the war on cash. You know, the sort of propaganda campaign to to uh, say that uh, cash is only for you know drug lords and and criminals. All these propaganda campaigns are also. Uh, hidden from us in the sense of what's the intent, you know, what's the goal of this propaganda war on cash. So what I think we've tried to do for these four years is, is, is dig up and expose all these things that are hidden and ask what is the, what is the intent, what's the goal, where is the end game of these um, machinations, manipulations, repressions. And I don't think the end goal is a continuation of the status quo. I don't think that's possible. Uh, I, you, I think you'd agree with me, Charles. I don't think we're trying to be conspiracy buffs here at all. We're not going no. there. I think I think there are a lot of good people that have just got bad bad ideas or are forced into doing things that they have no other alternative to do. I, I'll never support central bankers, but I don't think that they're a bunch of criminals. I think they're, they're they 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 got no choice. And and they're and in their defense, and I've argued this a few times, it's like a caterpillar tractor that has multiple gears to turn which tracks to turn it. When you've only got one gear, you're going to go around in circles. We're trying to steer the global economy with a monetary policy. It's not enough. So what's missing? Fiscal policy, structural public policy on on investments. There's all, taxation. There's all sorts of other gears. We're not doing anything with the other gears. So we've got one pulled hard hard right and we're going around at a smaller and smaller circle <laughs> that's the but, problem and where where are the where's the political action to address that and that's what we're seeing in the primaries people saying 
I don't trust the establishment to even talk about the problem. Exactly. And um, you're absolutely right. That's a good analogy about the, the dozer just going in circles when you only have monetary policy. But the other thing that uh, we've spoken about in many shows is the structural changes that have nothing to do with the government. And for instance, automation, the job loss, and the, the switch from bricks and mortar to online. And so uh, one, of, uh, one of my favorite shows was our um, retail um, commercial real estate dominoes. Um, yes, we did, we did a couple on that. We, yeah. were, we were quite and, strong on that. Right, and I think that's another one where we nailed it, and you've got some great slides here about um, store closures, um, sagging of same-store sales, you name it, by every measure, uh, commercial real estate, at least in the retail level, is, is overvalued and, and due for a major uh, market clearing. We've got so much extra floor space or retail space that we built. The malls are now empty if you go to malls. Even my wife says, what, what's going on? And she's like curious why there's nobody in the malls anymore. And the big box stores are, I mean, I just saw Sports, Sports Authority, the bigger ones shutting down, Borders shutting down, Macy's shutting down stores. I mean, it ha Radio Shack, it happens every day, but we don't, we just kind of let it go by. That was yesterday's news. But when you, you know, my friend Michael Snyder does lists, he's got one list that's just like 60, 60 points of major, major retail shutting uh, situations where they're shutting down, closing down. And, and it's accelerating. I have up here this chart. You know, the White House, the White House just came out with a major paper, and they're saying, and, and, and they're showing in the statistics, but of course they didn't put it into layman's language, but they said anybody that's making below $20,000 or less, there's an 80-some percent, 84 percent chance their job's going away. It's going to be replaced with robotics, which was our argument. If they're making less than thirty thousand dollars, there's a thirty-one percent, and if they're and if they're making less than, oh, that was twenty to forty thousand. Sorry, and if they're over forty thousand dollars, there's a good chance that job's not going away, at least from an automation standpoint. So what happens to the vast majority of our public that are at minimum wage, barely getting by? Their jobs are going away. Automation. That's not the government's fault. That's the reality. Their problem is what's public policy going to do with people who can't find work? And it isn't universal income, is it, Charles? I don't think so. And Which you know, was another that, show we had. <laughs> that's right, about uh, what's called the gig economy or the emerging economy of, of um, more freelance work um, and collaborative work. And, of course, one of the points that we made in, in our um, commercial real estate show was you don't need office towers in a gig economy, you know, not as many at least. You know, people don't necessarily have to come to work. They work at home and they collaborate online and they go out and do some job and then they, they go home again. They don't need to go to a central office and have a cubicle and all that. So do we need as many office towers as have been constructed? I think the answer is going to be very clearly no as we go forward. Did that sh first show on commercial real estate um, it was near Christmas, and we were talking about how much is going online, etc. Four years later, this Christmas, my neighbors in my area, I didn't see them running around doing Christmas shopping. All I saw was FedEx, UPS, trucks, every night all around the neighborhood. Every night. Uh, and right till 8 o'clock at night delivering. Everybody orders online. That's what's happened in four years. Now, how much commercial real estate do you really need out there to support that? And then you get into all these fast food places that people just aren't going to because they don't have the money anymore, or there's other other reasons. I mean, I'm not saying it's going away. I'm just saying there's way too much. It's overbuilt, overcapacity. That has to, and if it's not producing, it's got to be what shut down, right? Because somebody's got to pay for it. That's right. And we um, just perhaps as my ending note, you know, we've talked about the generational shift of um, from the baby boomers who are entering retirement to the millennials who um, often have, you know, very high student debt because that system's broken. And so and they have a different pattern of consumption, a different pattern of work. And so that's another structural change that, you know, the government is just kind of ignoring. Our public policies have no no. Um, 
response to these the consequences of these huge generational shifts and so we're not we're not saying that there's an easy fix out there but what I think we've always tried to do is let's talk about the real issues and the real problems because that's the first step toward any solution because there's a lot of really bright people who will come out with different ideas and if you get a dialogue going we get some of the smarter people in our society with are creative that come out with something that fixes problems but if you don't talk about it and nothing, nothing ever gets resolved when you, you, you kind of hide it. I think, Charles, you know, from these shows, what I've learned is um, it always takes so much longer for it to happen than you think. It just does. So it says, oh, this will go on forever. But no, it doesn't go on because when it does happen, it shocks you and comes out of nowhere. But somehow it wasn't out of nowhere. And, and the other thing I've learned is don't ever underestimate what the governments and central banks will do in desperation to keep this gig going. There's almost no level, legal or illegal, <laughs> uh, of course they change the law so it doesn't isn't illegal, it's just new law, uh, to keep this going. But it, 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 So it can only end, when it does end, end very badly. And then nobody's going to call us and say we were right though. Yeah. Unfortunately not. No pats on the back. <laughs> no, because everybody's going to be scrambling, so we need to be doing things about it now in, in, in preparation. Any closing comments, uh, Charles, on anything we've said? No, I just would say that um, I think Japan is, is proof of your point, that there's, there's no limit, really, to what the central bank and state can do um, up to and including, you know, printing money in vast quantities and delivering it to people's bank accounts or, you know, who knows. And, and, but that's not a healthy system and I think that's what we're uh, we're saying is is that sustainable is that a healthy vibrant economy that's creating a lot of opportunity for people or is it a a dead failed system that's just um, clinging on through the most extraordinary uh, central planning measures for those who are joining us for the very first time um, it's not that we just want to talk about problems we do have a lot of shows right Charles we've talked about what are the solutions yeah. What do you what do you need to be doing yourself now? Importance of independence. Yes. Um, not necessarily investment advice, but how you need to be looking at things in a different way. And of course, you've published. I, I have a lot to track how many books on this subject. How many books? At least seven, I think, on on this sub the subject. Yeah. yeah. So so there's lots of materials out there on solutions that I encourage our, our listeners to. We need to break. We're up against our. Our time slot here. Uh, Charles, could you just tell our listeners how they could follow your work? Because I know you publish uh, an article once a day, every day. So please visit me at of2minds.com. Talk to you again next month. Thank you very much, Gordon. Talk to you. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.